Greetings. Here we have part two of our bringing back this Model 3, TRS-80 Model 3 computer. And last time, uh, it really, it wasn't working. The drives were coming on, staying on. The screen wasn't lighting up. There was nothing appearing on the screen. And we ended up going up a whole bunch of wrong, you know, uh, alleys trying to troubleshoot something that didn't need to be troubleshot. And uh, here's what we finally found. So yes, there are two power supplies in here. The one in the back powers the logic board, which is back here, and it supplies the voltage to the monitor. It's just 12 volts that the monitor uh, creates all of its uh, necessary voltages from. And then we have a second power supply here that powers the floppy drives and the floppy controller. And the reason they did this, <clears throat> well, probably the primary reason was power requirements, but uh, when the Model 3 came out, they actually offered a Model 3 as a uh, cassette-only system. So it had no drives installed, it had blank plates on them, and it was the budget version. And you could upgrade it with two drives, and then you got the two drives, the uh, power supply, and the floppy controller, which is underneath the logic board inside this enclosure over here. So long story short, what we finally ended up finding out was that the power supply for the floppies was good, but the power supply for the logic and monitor was bad. So finally, again, after trying to troubleshoot something that couldn't be troubleshot at the uh, destinations, we put the good power supply, swapped it, and put it in here. And once we did that, the logic board came up and the monitor lit up. So we're going to start off today with our nemesis, which is this power supply, which was completely dead. Upon visual inspection, the only thing I could find was this pre-driver transistor in the primary. It had basically cracked open. And you can't see that. So here it is. So, yeah, that shouldn't be too hard to fix, right? Well, it wasn't. I found a replacement. I put it in. I powered up the board. Oh, and the uh, fusible resistor, which was here, was still good. So something wasn't, you know, this, the, uh, the oscillator wasn't working in the primary, and that's, you know, the switching supply needs needs an AC signal, obviously, to go through the main transformer and then derive all of the DC outputs. Anyway, when I uh, replaced the transistor and happily powered it up using a variac, around 70 volts AC things started to kick in and the whole board started to smoke. And uh, the main reason for that was this guy, which was the main power transistor feeding the primary. And I didn't check that. That was my bad. And I should have, because once the pre-driver was uh, feeding power to the main driver, all sorts of things went wrong and blew up and... Uh, Anyway, I worked on it. Well, of course, at first, the very first thing I did was I replaced the Rifa, which is already showing cracks but hadn't blown up. And uh, I spent a couple hours on it. I mean, for crying out loud, this is an inductor. The inductor was open. This resistor is open, or was open. So I replaced the two, 
I just, uh, you know, took me a few days to get a replacement in Dr. 4.7 micro Henry. And uh, this is the main capacitor in the oscillator circuit, which is supposed to be 220 microfarads, and it measured out at only a few picofarads. Anyway, the fusible resistor also went when I powered it up after replacing the transistor. And uh, after replacing all of these parts, I basically uh, I powered it up again, and uh, it worked. It was actually supplying the correct voltages, plus 5, plus 12, and minus 12. But the minute I hooked up something, I hooked up a load to it, it went into constant current mode, and the uh, voltage just dropped drastically. Here's a schematic from the official Radio Shack uh, service manual. There's some inaccuracies because the parts list, some of the parts values don't match with what's on the board. When you get into a situation like this, always replace the parts with what's already on the board, which doesn't always work when you had fireworks and you can't really read what the component, comp the bad component's value was at which point you have to revert to the uh, values given in the schematic. But uh, first try to replace it, first try to identify the, uh, pr the component that is present on the uh, board you're repairing and replace it with that. A lot of the uh, uh, smaller value uh, capacitors were just different values on the board. But if you look at it, so uh, we got AC coming in, it gets rectified and it drives the oscillator over here and then the oscillator feeds the high voltage trans, uh, transformer on the primary and out pop all the voltages we need uh, for 5, minus 12 and plus 12 and they get rectified and uh, smoothed and all that good stuff here but the main point of contention is and this is the feedback circuit so we have uh, a transformer that feeds back into the oscillator over here and uh, I guess it figures out whether we need more power coming in here. So to me it seemed obvious that the, something was wrong with the feedback putting it into constant current mode but uh, I couldn't find a problem with it. The oscillator was was changing frequency. I checked all the components in here, doing it properly. Anything that read weird got removed or one leg pulled and no matter what I did, it would not, you couldn't put a load on it. It didn't blow up or anything, it didn't make weird noises, it didn't make clicky noises, nothing like that. But everything, everything on this board was good. The only thing that I couldn't really, really test were the inductors and transformers, but I did some comparative testing with the uh, good power supply I have, and the values all seem to match. Long story short, <clears throat> after I put a couple, two, three hours into this, I decided that uh, this was probably going to take me a really long time to find, and I wanted to get this machine done up and running. So here's what we're gonna do. So mind you I haven't given up on this but the problem is I got TRS-80 Model 3 parts all over the place. I want to get this thing running, I want to put it back together and uh, when I feel adventurous again I will revisit this guy and I'll conquer him. But until then I went through my parts box and found this. It's actually, uh, it uh, generates all of the required voltages and it's about uh, twice, twice as powerful as this one. So theoretically I could probably power the entire TRS-80 Model 3 from this, but uh, let's not push our luck. 
the uh, the form it is smaller we're going to need some sort of an adapter plate to mount it the output puts here don't match the plugs that come out of the disk drives what does match is the AC input over here uh, just hot and neutral because the original didn't even have a ground pin uh, wasn't even hooked up uh, to the uh, AC outlet ground. So uh, let me pull some stuff and see if I can build a mounting plate for this that'll actually fit into the, inside the computer. And yes, I know we're supposed to be fixing stuff here, but uh, as I explained, as an engineer or as a tech, you have to know when to continue and uh, the point has come for me to continue I have a solution here and that's what I'm going to use and if we revisit this great but for now let's get this machine up and running and here's the new power supply ready to be mounted inside the computer I have a plexi base plate that basically has the same holes as the original so we can mount it to the uh, inside of the cabinet then the power supply is mounted on that plate and I had to build this thing here to accommodate the plugs that come out of the disk drives so uh, yeah I haven't I mean this came out of another project of mine so I know that this power supply is good but I actually never tested it in the TRS-80. So let's mount this thing in there and see if we done good. And here's the new power supply mounted in place. It's good. I checked clearances because the CRT is sitting in this cavity over here. So I made sure that there's no contact between this that it's not too close to the CRT even though the high voltage cup is about here but it's not that much taller than the original and everything's plugged in but there is one more thing we need to do before doing the test and that's the disk drives this machine was extremely dirty. Uh, what else is new? But yeah, the drives were just absolutely filthy. So, and I've done this in previous episodes. I took, I opened them up, I cleaned the, the uh, drive rails inside and relubricated them. But one thing I noticed was that the drives were kind of noisy. When the spindle turned, I just turned it by hand. It was squeaking on both of them. Worse on this, on this, on the top one than the bottom one. But it was pretty loud, even without powering up the drives. So uh, I took the uh, spindle part apart, and basically the bearing, the bearings were dry on both of them. So I gave it some. Uh, Singer sewing machine oil, let it soak in for a few minutes, then carefully wiped away any trace of oil that had gone awry, and then moving it by hand, it had quieted down the drives quite a bit. They, they still make some noise, but not nearly as bad as what they did before cleanup. So, after all that talk, I guess now it's time to see uh, everything's there. It should work. So, proper startup protocol for these is leave the drive doors open. Because TRS-80s, both the Model 1 and this, have this nasty thing that can happen. That is, if you turn them on, with the drive doors closed and a floppy inside, it takes a while for the uh, for the control signals to stabilize, and sometimes it pulses the drive. And with the head sitting on the floppy, it's basically a head crash. 
uh, and the flop is ruined. So you leave it, leave the drive door open. We're going to put in a second disc too to see if at least we can read it. Leaving it open. So uh, three, two, one, go. So uh, the screen lit up. It's saying the uh, uh, the prompt we saw before, cassette, and it's waiting for you to put in something, assuming that it's a cassette-based system. But now, close the doors, and we hit reset. So let's see if uh, our efforts paid off. Yeah, they're pretty quiet. I can't even hear the head step anymore. But what did it do? Well, it booted DOS. The machine's back. So what we have is a stupid date prompt. Okay, and now the only other thing remaining is, so can we do a directory on drive zero? Yes. So now can we do a directory on drive one? Actually the two disks are identical, so you're going to see, if drive one works, you're going to see the same contents. But, yeah, let's see. So we're going to do directory colon one. Oh, it went to the first drive. Yep, and it pulled the directory. It's uh, kind of anticlimactic here, but just doing blind maintenance on the drives seemed to have worked. So what we're going to do next is uh, we're going to put the case back together and then run a few quick tests to see if we can format disks on both drives. And if we can, we're done. The machine is back in business. All right, we're still booted up. I got a disk. Kind of looks new, except a little weathered, but uh, it's always a good idea when you're using a floppy, an unknown, a floppy with unknown content. Well, of course, make sure there's nothing on there uh, that you may need. But if you have an unlabeled disk, hey, that's too bad. Should have labeled it if there was anything important on it. It's always a good idea to use the bulk tape eraser to basically make to unformat the disk of whatever's on there. Otherwise, sometimes the format routine may get confused and refuse to format the disk. The test we're going to run is basically use the built-in backup routine that takes the DOS, the TRS DOS disk, and backs it up to this drive. And uh, if it sees no format, if it can't read the drive, it'll go ahead and format it. So, uh, so we use the built-in backup program. Source drive is zero. Destination drive is one. Source disk master password. Yeah, that had me going for a while. Nobody will ever guess that. Analyzing diskette. So it's seeing if it can read the disk. Can't read it, so it starts formatting. So it's going to take a little bit of time. These are 40 track drives. 
But uh, while we're waiting for that, there really isn't anything else to do. I guess the big job on this was also cleaning the keyboard. But the keyboard works. Everything works. Oh, we have to figure out a way to put this model plaque, make some sort of a model plaque for this because that looks too bare, needs a little bit more cleaning on the outside of the cabinet. But if this format works, I think we can assume that this machine is functional. I'll try to find a couple of neat software programs and see if we can boot them up and play them. But uh, yeah, while I'm talking, we are basically getting... We're almost there. It's formatting and verifying at the same time. So instead of just formatting the whole thing and then doing verify, go, hey, track two is bad. So the disk is good. It's telling us there are no flawed tracks. It's not going to do an entire copy. Backup actually only backs up copies uh, the files that are on there instead of just doing a blind copy of every sector. But, uh, all right, all right, we're done. Didn't complain about anything. So what we're going to do is take the newly created disk and see if the system boots off of it. That's like for drive compatibility and does this lie? Or did it actually write? Anyway, we just reset. The head steps on it. Checks the uh, second drive. And boom. And see, it even remembered that it already has a date and time. So it doesn't ask us again. But yeah, looks like we're good. Let me just see if I can find some interesting software program or two and see what that looks like, but she's alive. So for the final and ultimate test, turn it on. We don't even have to wait for the screen to warm up. Asking for the date again, time, and we're ready. And here is the ultimate test. Come on, there you go. So there it is. We can now sit here all night and play Zork. Open mailbox. Does a disk access every time you type something in that's actually that it understands? Read the leaflet. And there you have it. But uh, before ending this, a word about floppy drive maintenance. And uh, uh, it concerns the read-write heads in, in the floppies. So uh, first of all, uh, if, if you're working with floppies, do not use head cleaning kits. Head cleaning kits basically look like a regular floppy, something like this. But the medium in there isn't a thin magnetic uh, disc, but rather a slightly abrasive disc that they also give you alcohol to wet the medium with and then put it in. And as the disc spins, it's supposed to clean the heads. Don't do that. You do not want to put 
get let the head come in contact with something abrasive. It's this, this this was some marketing idea some floppy company came up with and it's a really really bad idea. So my advice is don't do that. Second thing about heads is uh, a lot of people will say well the first thing you do on a floppy drive that hasn't been used you know that you don't know and is dirty and all of that you have to clean the read write heads. No you don't. On a floppy drive the uh, read write head is in direct contact with the medium you put into it. So the minute the drive starts spinning or the disk starts spinning whatever there is on the read write head gets wiped clean in the next single or, or the next couple of revolutions of the disk. It won't hurt anything but you don't need to do it. It's not necessary. The drive rails need to be cleaned and lubricated and all of dirt gotten out of it but other than that as this demonstrated the drives were good and once the dirt was gone they came back to full operation. So thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit the notify button and maybe like and we'll see you next time.